Hey all you people out there in Jetland, it's Malcolm High, proud member of the class of 1967. I am sitting here with... Sharon Prefontaine. As a student, I was Sharon Shaw. Fantastic. And, and Sharon is very unique in that not only was she a student and an alumnus of Sunnyvale High School, she was also a teacher. Sharon, tell me where it all began for you in Sunnyvale. Because I know you didn't go to elementary or middle school. I did not, and uh, frankly, it was really, uh, I was a Navy kid, right, so my dad was stationed at Moffett, and I had moved about every 20 months in my lifetime. So coming to Sunnyvale, uh, again, the new kid on the block, and didn't know anybody, and the clicks from Benner and the, the, the other junior, the, the, junior, yeah, the, the junior high They were fears, junior highs then, the junior yes, high then. had already Happened, established you know so what year are we talking when you we're were, talking 1961 the and, summer and you would have been yeah. you had already completed an eighth grade someplace yes I, w I went to San Ysidro junior high what, what so town is that in? that is just across the border from Tijuana in San Diego there you go yeah where um, you None know, of this is rehearsed, by the way. This we, is as you're watching this, as I'm shooting two cameras. Sharon, <laughs> which camp? We don't have a director. <laughs> which, so San Ysidro. So San Ysidro Junior High, uh, which is where the the caravan is coming through right now. I've heard of it. And what a, what a um, so I was a flag girl. We had that then, and uh, you know, kind of a eighth grader, ready to go because there uh, you went seven, eight, nine. Right, so only three years of high school for the people down there. Correct. So it was a shock in a variety of ways. Sure. Culturally, yes. Um, although somewhat similar culture because of the, the Hispanic influence. But here I was going to be big time, ninth grader, and I, now I come to a brand new school. I know no one, no one knows me. Uh, it's intimidating. And apparently, according to people that I've talked to since then, I was intimidating. I was actually shy, but for whatever Your reason, presence. the vibe was, yeah, yes. that I was a scary chick. Anyway, so I became friends with a girl down the street, so I was hanging with kids that were older, you know, they were um, miscreants. In what neighborhood? Real quick, what neighborhood? Yes, I lived on Georgia Avenue. Which I think it now... There is no Georgia Avenue in Sunnyvale. You're making that up. Yeah, Where was no, it? it's still there. I went to see. I th I'm thinking it's off of Morse. Uh, if you... What, what uh, elementary it's, school? It's, it's across from Duane. Right. I think it's near Sunnyvale Junior High or Sunnyvale Elementary now. Is that oh, probably... A, I don't know. New yeah. schools popped up. Um, and, 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 and I'm not sure if you mentioned it. And your maiden name at the time was? Shaw. S-H-U-L-L. Shaw. S-H-U-L-L. Right. Now, just as a... That's a tongue twister. Sharon. Sharon Shaw. You don't have a middle name with an S-H, do you? No. No, it's <laughs> Francis, which is so much more hey, elegant. There's a, there's a Francis in Sunnyvale. That's a... Yeah, I know. Street. I know, and I want to live on it because it has very nice... By the way, uh, we, nice we, are, we are doing this interview at Sharon's lovely apartment, which is directly across the street from Walt's, Walt's bike, bike Shop. Shop. And I think if we would have walked 50 years ago that way, 100 feet, we'd be in Grissel's Market. Yeah, Because <laughs> the train tracks so. are just on the other side. Walt's is over my shoulder, and uh, the train... And the Del Monte, yes. former Del Monte, yeah. it is a block down. Yes. So, so let's refocus. So you're going to be a okay. freshman at Sunnyvale High. Yes. It's, this, it's the year 1961, 62 year? Am I doing that right? 61, 62. Two. 62, 62. As we do our math yeah, here, obviously right. not rehearsed. Yeah. Um, but I did, I did want to sidestep for a moment uh, relative to my name, Shaw. Um, because, uh, you know, recently with the DNA all that stuff that you can 23 do. 23 and me. And right, so I do 23 and me, and I come to find out I'm 50% Asian, they say. And I think, well, that's curious. And they must, somebody's messing with me or had a bad day. So I do it again. Uh, I'm 32% Asian, 17% sure. Polynesian. Actually, then they update 50% Filipino slash Austronesian. 
Shaul is not my bloodline. So let me just put that out there because I thought that was very interesting. So I have no idea who my father is, my birth father. Wow. Yeah, I find this out at 70 years old. I need to ask you a question, again, unrehearsed. Let's say, through this, they track down your dad. Yes or no, I want to know him if he's still alive. I would be fascinated. To, to, to talk to him. Yeah. yeah. And I would also be fascinated to know, you know, because as we age, the medical history. We don't age, we look fabulous. Uh, thank you. Don't <laughs> I don't have enough hair to do that, but I will. Yeah. Uh, um, no, you know what I mean? Sure. So, uh, just, yeah, I'd just be intrigued. I just did it. I did the swab. I got a Christmas present. Yeah, the uh, suggestion is my mother was a player. Your mother was a player? <laughs> because... So, so everyone out there looking at this, your definition of player yeah. is not water polo jump in the pool. Yeah, that's it's... right. So I just, yeah, so okay. fortunately my mom and dad have passed. I'm an only child. Sure. So I have no way of... No. Anyway. No, that's, that's intriguing. That's so intriguing. only child, bounces around every 20 months. Now I'm back. Now I'm at Sunnyvale High School. Don't know anybody. So for the first couple of years... I just kept my head down. The, the, the group that I was mainly affiliated with, because I always wanted to be in theater, I was in speech and debate. Okay. And Natalie Weber was... That was her, that's her maiden name. Her that maiden. Natalie Weber was my teacher. Oh, oh, sorry, interrupted. So Natalie Weber's a teacher. Was the name. teacher there. She later went to Homestead. Yes. And she's quite, she became quite famous. She's still alive, but she had a name, as did Carmendale Fernandez at Fremont. And so you had these big time speech and debate coaches. Got it. Now, speech and debate, I sent you an article actually yep. that you posted, was a lesser being in the same way that girls' sports were lesser beings than, Prior to title IX. than male, yeah, than male sports. Um, and especially the major sports, because even for males, if you played tennis, it was, you know. Yeah. At any rate, um, so that was really home for me, and then joining theater. And I ended up, uh, over the four years, choreographing all the musicals with Bill Stretch and Bob Ferreira. I was going to mention Mr. Ferreira. Yeah, yeah. and Marilyn... I can't think of her last name, but she was Marilyn there for a brief Marilyn time. Mason, but that's no, I know Marilyn, Marilyn Mason, but also Beverly Gable, who was there at the time. Got Beverly it. Gable uh, was the sort of the dance teacher, and she later married and went to Southern California. But she took those of us who were dancers under her wing. She took us, and this was what was so really unusual uh, compared to my teaching experience later. Sure. Uh, took us to a, um, Eric Sadler, I think his name was. Anyway, he's a professional dancer. So she took us to a session, a seminar uh, in, uh, at Stanford by him. Was this all on her own? On, all on her, I don't know how she, we didn't pay anything. Uh, we went to a uh, ballet in San Francisco as a modern ballet with modern music. Um, so there are a variety of things that mm -hmm. we did then as kids. Now the one thing that I will say as a, as a kid going through school was that I didn't know until later as a teacher we were tracked, right? So you were track one which meant you were probably college material. You were track two, which meant you would probably go into business or merchandise or yes. retail. Yep. And then you were track three, which meant, and this sounds really terrible, but that basically high school was your terminal degree. That's the term that's used in education, terminal degree. And literally, we were the other side of the tracks, but that's a whole different yeah. subject. But that's... Yeah. And later that became... Oh, I need to ask, how did you know, when did you come aware, become aware of it? I think that, when I got into college. Got it. Uh, so the I, signs popped up that that's what they were yeah, doing. Yeah, it was with. like, okay, so... Who's doing the evaluation? How, that? Well, that's right. How did they determine it? What about the kid that starts off as a freshman and then could be... And that's what I learned as a teacher. Yeah, you, you can't You can't do that slotting. And so it ended up part of the 
argument that they used to close Sunnyvale High School eventually was that we were a segregated school. Part of that had to do with that tracking, because who was at the lowest track? Non-native English speakers, for the most part, sure. of which we had, when, when in 80 when it closed, 58 languages and dialects at Sunnyvale High School. Yet they said we were a segregated school. To me, segregation means all of a kind, yes. not a group like that, a conglomerate. You know. Real quick on the when you said when it closed in eighty, closed in the it was the eighty eighty one. It was the yeah. That so was, yeah. so closed in eighty. It, it closed in June of eighty one. Right. Yeah. So the eighty one. And because uh, people go back and forth on that. And, yeah. And sadly, as as we take a side turn, there were students there that had sophomore, junior, and senior years to complete. That we're told, you know, you're you're essentially going to go to our rival. Fremont, and I'm sure a few others went scattered. Was well, the way they drew the lines, and I don't know if you know this, but the way they drew the lines, if you take, say, Homestead as the, uh, as the perpendicular, sure. right, they just hacked it this way. One, two, three. So you ended up, you hmm. went to Lindbrook, yeah. even if you lived in Lakewood, or you went to Homestead, or Didn't you know went, that. Yeah. So what that meant was, and again, I didn't know this until I was a teacher, what that meant was that the kids who lived in Lakewood, many of whom were uh, challenged already about going to school, yeah. uh, and uh, Prop 13 had passed, yeah. so we had no buses. So what they did, essentially, was really anti-student, <laughs> in that they sent these kids out of their comfort zone, made it hard for them to get there, and then they wondered, why did scores go yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it was like that. So anyway, so, so back as we to circle my, back to yeah, 1961. So 1961, I'm there, I don't know anybody, and I really don't, I fell in love with Mr. Mesa, my English That would be teacher. Mr. Pete Mesa. Mr. Pete Mesa, who, by the way, is listed incorrectly as Richard Mesa, in the year who is his nephew yes 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 who lives right shout down out to rich here. shout out to rich because he lives right down here yeah. there's a mess of those messes I, I there's a mess of those there. messes yes. mary is right down the street and ralph yeah. and i have become close and uh sadly ralph lost his uh older brother oh. who was actually fremont but you know knew the sunnyvale area like the, uh, the back of his hand continue so um yeah, so my freshman teachers uh, that connected with me, um, Annette Seaman, the typing teacher, because I got a certificate, because I could type over 70 words a minute. I'm going to uh, test you. ASDF, <laughs> JKL, semicolon. <laughs> I can remember, I think 25 words a minute was me, which is like, you know, the pecking, and then... People go, 65, I go, what? How do you do that? It, for, the, for those of you that are watching this that are under 40 years old, typewriters. Typewriters existed. It was called keyboarding. Keyboarding. Though. Yeah, but it, it, it was typing. And actually, uh, the track one people had to finagle in order to get into business or other uh, practical classes. Finagle is a polite way of saying what word? Yeah. <laughs> Dodge. <laughs> you, well, you, if I wanted to take typing, in other words, that's not a tra that wasn't like a track one skill yeah, that they are. that they had determined was. Somebody important. else was doing that for those. Right. Track. So some yeah, you were going to hire a track two to do typing for you. I mean oh that was God. sort of. I mean when you think about it that way, that's really the paradigm. But. Uh, we didn't think of it that way, you know, as kids. I mean, we were all just friends with. In all the much interviews everybody. that I've done of teachers at Sunnyvale High, no one's used the word paradigm, and I am impressed. <laughs> Is that 20 cents? Is a paradigm? That's 20 cents. It's a, That's a quarter. Cent. I think it's a 50 cent word. A paradigm. No, no. A pair of dimes. I can't explain my puns. You're a Scotsman. I'm a Scotsman. I'm a Scotsman. 
By the way, I do have scones. No, we, we only have one track mic. I do have scones We and just tea. have one track mic. It's scones and tea. Scones and tea? I do have. Let's get ensconced in that <laughs> Thank you very much. You use paradigm, I use ensconced. Yes. I but couldn't I'm spell and neither one of us could probably spell it. Correctly. I know, and then there's the paradox, which is of course two doctors. Two doctors. <laughs> this gets I forgot ready. which camera I'm supposed We're to be We're going to edit this out, right? We'll see. Well, well, hold on a second. For the track one people, we leave it out. Yes. For the track two people, it's every... You track three guys. We're going to put it on a loop. <laughs> that a dime. That's a, is that a shelling? So in my uh, sophomore... I think it was in my sophomore year, I tried out maybe... Maybe it was my junior year. Sophomore year was the first year I ever got drunk. Statue of limitations, we're all good. It was very bad. It was a very bad event. Um, nevertheless, uh, I think it was in my sophomore year, I tried out for cheerleader. Failed miserably. But you and had a dance background. I, I did, and eventually, as a senior, became a song girl. So I was there with uh, Jan Anderson and Sandy. Jan Anderson, Anderson Mesa. Yes. One of my favorites. Another Mesa. And, <laughs> and then uh, uh, Sandy Estes. Yep. Uh, bless her heart. And um, let's see, Pam Alvarado. And Sharon Brooks was head. Sharon Brooks. Bob Brooks so was head. So rest in peace. Yes. Um, and I'm leaving somebody out. Kathy Bernal. As we take circuitous routes to this Sorry. interview, I do have to ask. Yes. My next door neighbor was involved in drama, and her name was Sandy Broom. And she sang in the play Oliver. I'm not sure how involved you were with plays and things like that. I was in a lot of the plays, but I don't remember Oliver. I remember Oliver, the pajama yeah, yeah, game. Yeah. She sang uh, the, the song As Long As He Needs Me. But, oh, uh, maybe I do remember. Yeah, she was a freshman, so that would have been your... Let's see, here she graduated in 67. So anyway, that's, um, and, and Mr. Ferraro was actually a neighbor to my parents when they moved. Yeah, he Bob Ferraro. The corner. He, was, he was an interesting guy. I interesting. really liked him and his wife, Jan. They were a very cool couple. So uh, one of the highlights of my high school career was that uh, I was su very successful in speech and debate. And right. so every year I qualified for the state tournament. Wow. And uh, the state tournament was, uh, at that time, held only at one location, and that was UC Santa Barbara. So now you have a thousand... Slumming it. You have a thousand kids descending on the college with only as much supervision as the two adult supervisors. Are we leading up to the first time drunk? <laughs> could provide. No, I didn't. Oh. But there is a story. Uh, briefly, that uh, Lola Flynn and I, uh, Lola decides she's going to order a drink. We're in a restaurant, so, and we're, teachers are all over the place. And Shirley Keller was the assistant to Carmen L. Fernandez from Fremont. And she was cool because she was younger, right? So Lola goes up to the bar, and I'm standing with her, and to get those stories straight, you're 60, you guys are 16 tops. Yeah. And she orders a sour whiskey. Whiskey sour. She says sour whiskey. The bartender immediately oh, looks at her. I tried it on your Yeah. And the bartender immediately yeah. looks at her. Flag. Uh, Shirley Keller came up behind us and she said, get away from this right now. But it's a story that you should Shirley... should for it says, I'll take the rocks on the bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we're, dis, we're dyslexic uh, alcoholics. I'll but take it. At any rate, that's a story that Shirley oh, still tells. Shirley's 80-something now. But she still... Oh, she still makes still reference to that. She still tells that story about, I remember when you guys tried to get, get away with drinking at the bar. Um, anyway, it was a great thing to be a song girl. It was, uh, I, I loved uh, about school that they had that um, congressional convention. Do you remember that? I don't know. Uh, they had officers or representatives from the different classes, and they literally took 
a whole day, and you would go and you would wow. uh, try to pass bills. You know, it was a it was a grand get to know way. the mechanics of how yes, the government works. Yes, of how yeah. government works. Or <clears throat> That's pretty good. Used to work. And, Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> we said we made an agreement. No politics during yeah. any of this. But um, bum, bum, bum. so uh, at at any rate, so then I uh, and I got to be a graduation speaker, which I was very pleased with. I managed to trip on the stairs. I did not fall, but I managed to on trip on the way up or on the way down. On the way down. No, oh, you speak. already had your speech done. No, on the way down to speak. Oh, oh on the way down I'm the to speak. I'm the only one Prior, standing. Yes, I'm the only one walking. You went straight for the th sympathy. It, Excellent. You know, way to do it. Won them over. Anyway, but there were about I think there were about six of us. So we didn't have the numbers of valedictorians or anything like that. I don't sure. even remember if we tried out. Um, I love Miss Buzz Diker. Uh, Miss Buzz. Yeah, Buzz was uh, and remained a friend because, you know, once I went back to teaching, sure. right? Um, and she took, we had a foreign exchange student named Paloma. I made contact with her. And yeah, she still was. And it was me, and I can't remember who the other people were. I want to say there were about four of us girls from GAA. Girls right? Athletic Association. Um, and she took us to her home, in, her parents' home in Reading. And they... No, we're making references to, to Miss Buzz Buzz Diker. Diker. Yeah. So again, here's a thing that was okay. Nowadays... It'd be shady. What's going on? Well, yeah. What does that mean? Why is she doing... You know, At I mean, this point, Malcolm, be... Malcolm will jump in and say yeah. something that you may already know. But uh, Mr. Stanga, our principal, uh, had Miss Buzz Diker as a student. student. Yes, I knew that. And he always said we went to high school together. <laughs> and and uh, she took typing. But so yeah, back up in, the, in that area. Yeah, so. I had I had colleagues who used to say, yeah, she was my teacher. Virgil Pate. Virgil used Pate. To, I know Virgil. Okay, so I ended up teaching with Virgil Pate. At class of '64, yep. over at Monta Vista, right, and uh, so that's what he used to say. Yeah, she was my teacher. She was my teacher. Instead of he question, was a class question. Enemy. So you took something that most people at Sunnyvale High School didn't take, which was speech and debate. Yeah. Where has that served you in your life? Obviously, as a teacher, you know the ability to convey a thought in front of people. But are there any times in your life now that we've reached our fifth? Are we in our fifties? So we've reached where you say, thank God that I took that because it gave me fill in the blank. Um, well, I did become president of the California High School Speech Association. There we go. For 10 years, I was president uh, for the whole state of that organization, which sponsors high school speech and debate, uh, which has changed, but nevertheless, uh, I also do uh, high school accreditations and I lead teams of people and I believe that uh, in terms of negotiating, in terms of running a group of diverse people, okay. uh, I think that, that that has stood me in good stead. I also think it enabled me to feel the fear and do it anyway so that uh, in term, you know, and I told, I used to tell students that just feel the fear and do it anyway. Not something stupid yes. like jumping off a building, but <laughs> pretend the audience is in their underwear. Mm. I know, I know. Just, but that's the idea: is that somehow you feel it, and you become used to. Oh, that's how that feels. Yes, and I, and I when I do that, mm -hmm. and nothing happens. I can still do it. Yes. Um, so, I, I think the, the really, in terms of learning speech, the feedback that I get, I can't tell you the number of students that I have, and everybody hates speech. Everybody hates giving speech. It's the number one fear. They'd rather have snakes. Public speaking. Right? Public speaking in front of a group. They would rather have snakes, pits of snakes or any other, I mean, you look at the polls that they do. 
Um, those of us who did it, it binds you in a way that other classes don't. I, and I watched it as a teacher. Um, so it's kind like, of go through, you've gone through a book. Like you're, going you're, through an earthquake together or some yeah. kind of other crisis. Yeah. Kids are more supportive. Yes. They you can relate. Can, yes. Yeah. You can be goofy. And I have to tell you, I think that speech and debate generally ends up being, it's not all the cool kids. Yeah. It's all the kids who kind of don't exactly know where they fit. And that's where they fit. And you see, I taught uh, as a teacher, I eventually taught a required class called Basic Oral Communication. And the district was stupid and withdrew it because Berkeley didn't think it was important to be able to talk. Uh, it, because everybody can talk, right? That's all you need to do. But I saw kids who were not good at English in terms of writing and they had no confidence, but they were high verbals. Yeah. And, and they, you could see them learn that they were okay. And once you get the oral skill, yeah. orality precedes literacy. So if you can speak, and you learn very often your grammar from your parents, sure. right? So if you learn that, and you begin to write like you speak, it's a done deal. You, you, yeah, and your body language. Everything. It, it, it's a, it's you know, a package. Um, but that confidence alone, I think, of, of performing, but I always wanted to perform. I actually, when I graduated from high school, I was, uh, uh, I, I didn't do all the things that I should have done for scholarships and things like that. Anyway, so I went to San Jose State uh, while my smarter friends. Part of it was I didn't want to go away, although I was accepted at UCLA. Um, my, my father, father was, was <laughs> Craig, Craig was very, was very discouraging, discouraging of me leaving. leaving. I, don't I don't know whether that was money, money or, or distance or what. Yes. Um, I wish I had gone to a UCLA. That's a, a regret that I have. Also because I got pregnant in my freshman year of college. So uh, it can know, change your life. A variety of factors. But I did go through, uh, when I went to college, I went through uh, community, I started out as a drama major and a dance minor. I was going to be Shakespearean theater. Uh, I was going to go to England. And, uh, if it was Scotland, she would have blurted it out. Yeah. She had to whisper. <laughs> Well, I didn't want to start. So, so June of 65, you are a graduate of Sunnyvale High. Uh-huh. And you're living at home. Uh-huh. And did you, uh, were you on campus at San Jose State, or did you commute? Hmm. I commuted. And in retrospect, because I did, my first two years were at San Jose State, and I commuted, and I wished I would have, A, been on campus, or B, gone away. I wish I'd gone away. Yeah. So you did, you did four straight years at San Jose State? Mm -hmm. And then got your degree? And then a couple your... more, because <laughs> I got a master's, yeah. And you got your master's. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I really love school. I always loved school. Tell me why. Um, I like learning. I really like learning new stuff. Uh, and so, for example, right now I'm reading the book Sapiens. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a really interesting analysis of how humans, how we got to be the way we are. And then there's a, an add-on book to that called Homo Deus um, that talks about the impact of technology. It sounds like a textbook, if you know what I mean. It sounds really boring. It's like, of course, she's a teacher. She would read that stuff. But it's not like that at all. It's just, it's, I'm fascinated by culture, by American culture, and that's what my, my master's thesis was about, was actually movies. Wow. I, wrote, I wrote about teenage films in the 1980s. It was called um, Techno Teens and Bimbos in the 1980s. Wait, let's say that slowly. Techno Teens, Techno -teens and, and bimbos. bimbos in the 1980s. Of course it is named that. And it was, and it had to do with uh, 
Reagan's notion of uh, fly now, pay later, and trickle down, and how the lack of consequence was reflected in teenage movies. Uh, War Games, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, and so on. So there. Anyway, that was one of my favorite things that I did in college. You name two, name, name a few more. Movies? Of, of the movies, yeah. Like that. Well, I had to, the, the criteria were that they had to have been in box, top box office. Yes. Um, so the people that I Yeah, asked. during the 80s. So it was uh, Back to the Future, right? No Consequence. Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, kids Smarter Than Adults. No Consequence. Uh, I, see, war, I see a theme here. With the war movie. Games. Uh, you start a war, oh, oops. But again, through the virtue of technology and the kids being smarter than the adults, no consequence. Uh, I threw in, although it did not fit that particular criteria, but there were no female leads in any of the top box office. So I threw in um, 16 Candles. I was going to go. With Molly Ringwald. Who was the director that had all three? Uh, John Hughes. 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 John, John Hughes. Hughes. Um, and, uh, and in it, you see all of these, like, gender, like misogynistic. The grandparents. Right. The I way mean, they, they treated Molly. Well, yeah. It's, you know, I mean, they, you talk about the boobs, the girl's yeah. period, yeah. The, and you talk about the guy's penis size. You know, you had Long Dong, whatever his name was, yes. right? It's racist. It's every thing that people are protesting now was... But it got big laughs. Inherent in those films, we didn't take it politically, yeah. right? We didn't. My analysis was, though. Yes. So it kind of like. Anyway, so those were the four films that I had to watch a thousand times. I will not watch any of those you, movies you, you now. Won't be those. It's like I'm like up to here with those teenage films. But anyway, so I went through the intern program to become a teacher. And uh, what that meant was that I went... Let's do our dates. So graduate in 65. Yeah. Four years at San Jose State. So right. So we're up to... And six. in my sophomore year, I switched to communication studies. Okay. Because I did not need to take any more language. <laughs> which, by the way... There's no debate on that. Which, by the way, for future reference, do not take French. Unless you're going to go live in France, because, or Africa maybe, uh, because it's uh, absolutely useless. I go to Mexico all the time now, and I'm ashamed because I'm not really fluent. As, yes. Not fluent. I can get by tourists, but anyway. So uh, I uh, major in communication studies and minor in English, and. Uh, the intern program for teaching. So you graduate from college and you, that summer, uh, take classes and you start teaching. You do a six week stint and then you take classes. You're, you're jumping right in. Right, so you get paid the following September. I needed to do that because I needed the health insurance. Because I already had the business of living. Because that pregnancy, unwanted by both the father and I, uh, resulted in twins. So I'm 18, I have twins. My senior year of college, I'm carrying 18 units. I'm working three jobs because there is no husband anymore. And, and, two, and you're carrying two kids. And that's why I decided to do the intern yeah. program. Yeah. So I teach. <laughs> and when I go in, Mr. Buchan is still... George Buchan? I can't call him George. I choke trying to call him George because he's my teacher. Yes. Now, with, when I was a student with Mr. Buchan, we were in the E-Wing, right? which is on the farthest outside. I don't know if you remember the layout of the school. So we're in the E-Wing. Been there many times. Okay, right. And... I was first period. 
and we were all asleep because we were teenagers. Yes. He had the rod. Or the ruler. The metal rod or the ruler. This was the metal rod. Kids sleep on the desk, right? Mr. Buchan, slowly, well, when we all knew, we're all watching, we're all watching, we're all dead quiet. Nobody warns the kid. Yes. I mean, nothing, right? Nobody pokes him or anything. You're just glad it's not you. Yep. Buchan walks up, slams the thing on the desk. I, it was just so lucky he never hit a kid. Yeah. You know? I mean, he was really, I learned a whole lot more about him when I became a teacher. Sure. That was interesting. But I could not call those people by their first names. How did you get to Sunnyvale High School as a teacher? I applied. So, and that was? The only application that I made for a teaching go. job. I was you tracked yourself. I was interviewed by six or eight people. I got hired because I could coach speech. You, yeah. Now, uh, Ferreira had gone. Um, there had been, when I first took over, as a teacher there, Jeannie Taft was there. She unfortunately died as a result, apparently, of a birth control pill. Oh, jeez. Uh, causing some kind of a medical problem. Uh, what was his name? Clyde Wilson was there for a little while. And that year, the, the fall of that year was 1970? I started teaching in 1970. And oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. I started teaching in 19... I graduated from school. So the 71 school year, 70-71 school year for, for Sunnyvale High. Yeah. Wow. That was my first year. So I was 22, and my very first day as a teacher, this handsome young man wants to walk me to class. And I say, sure. He has no idea that you he are He has no a, idea that I'm the teacher. The teacher. And so he walks me to my classroom, which is like, again, back in the E-wing, and like Mr. Lane's old classroom or something. So we walk around, and he goes, oh, the teacher's not here yet. And I go, yeah, actually, she is. And he, go, he looks at me, and I go, it's me. Oh, my <laughs> God. That is classic. It was that so. Is classic. Uh, Do you remember? You know, there's a certain know. evil streak that I have like that. But anyway, it made me laugh a lot, and and that was one of the sort of the issues. You think about the early '70s. It was a very loose time. Steve Gallant was a teacher there. Bill Rushton. We, we were all Bill freaks. Rushton. We were all freaks. You know, I mean, we were in that whole counterculture, you know, 70s thing, and we didn't have those same boundaries that now you would get arrested for. You know, I had kids come to my house because they weren't happy yeah. at their own houses, you know? You extended it. Yeah, yeah. and so, um, you know, the number of kids that are still in touch, um, Dennis Gobetz was one of them, um, Unfortunately, he's passed since then. Was Mr. Walker there then? I think he yes, had a run. Yes, Doug Walker was I sat, there. I sat and did a wonderful... Doug Walker was with his first wife then. Good guy, good teacher, good friend. His daughter was now... I just had a dinner of, I don't know, maybe it was last year, teaching him on a Vista. I called up Max Epps that morning that I was going to go out to his house. Uh-huh. And Max and I, through those football games, have become real close. And I said, Max, I'm going out there to do the video. Do you want to go? He goes, let me call you back. And he calls me back. He goes, I had something I got to do, but I would do anything because I hadn't seen him in like 20 years. Uh -huh. So it was great. So it was the three of us with a wide shot. And, and then, oh, it was, I loved it. Let me say a couple of things about, about uh, teaching. My first, first, as an intern, you're not supposed to take on an extracurricular activity. But I did. So I had the speech and debate. But because of either my personality, who I was, the new kid, I don't know. I got the kids who we would now call at risk. Yeah. Although many Sunnyvale High School kids were. So the difference from when I was a student, that population of you know, Philco Ford, 
uh, Lockheed, Lockheed yeah. um, Moffett Field, and retail business owners in Sunnyvale. That was the population when I was a student. When I come back as a teacher, 1970, I'm running the CETA program. Okay. Vietnamese yeah. immigrants. So spell it out. What is CETA? CETA was a government. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that's an acronym. It's CEDA, yeah, and it was a government program that allowed kids to get work permits uh, who gotcha. who were here. Many of them on their own. I had these sweet Vietnamese kids who would come in. One of whom was probably 14 years old, a young boy, who says he's living with his older brothers who also got out. I heard a, a story in my speech and debate class from a girl who had come across on the boat and talked about the fact that her mother had stood up the whole time with her leg against the wall to protect her younger sister. Jeez. So I heard these just heart-wrenching yeah. stories from that first wave, not the rich ones who bought their way out, yes. but, but the boat people. Yeah. And this young boy was with his brother I said, what happened to your parents? He said, I don't know. My father was a scientist, my mother was a teacher, and they came and got them in the night. So that was the population that you were, you were running into as a, a young teacher. Your heart drew you to this. Oh, uh, I have to tell you. And I started a program at, at Sunnyvale called the PLUS program that combined uh, math, social studies, and English. It was for the freshmen. It was a very successful program, which, of course, they, yeah. you know, soft money, and it went away. Um, I was always sent, I had a, cl had a class. These days, I don't know if you know what a 504 is. So you have, in, you have special education. And then you have a 504, which would be kids like with ADD or learning, some other learning behavior. Issues. So some, but not a, not a diagnosable. Sure. Okay. So there was this group that weren't quite special ed, but they weren't quite mainstream, called adaptives. Somebody had to come up with a word, and that's what they did. They came up with adaptives, and it was like... 15, 16 boys and one girl. And these were kids who, if you took them into a classroom with typewriters, would wrap rubber bands. The train just went by. Ah, oh, yes it did. I heard the whistle. Would wrap rubber bands around all the keys. <laughs> so you could... You just couldn't look there because then that one would be doing yeah. that. It was like... Pranking and just, you know. Uh, you know. I would also be sent, uh, and this was early on, uh, gay kids, uh, because they would go to uh, some other person and they would say, go talk to Prefontaine. <laughs> but these were openly... Yeah, well, no, oh, nobody was open. Okay. So you're saying that somebody... I'm saying they would go into a counselor or they would go into somebody and they, they needed would somebody say, to talk to. Yes, okay. and they would say, go talk to Prefontaine. Yeah. So that, that was sort of my role um, as, as a teacher. But I really loved Sunnyvale High School kids uh, at that point. And part of the reason for that is they were authentic. It wasn't about grades, it wasn't, they understood about relationship mm -hmm. and they, uh, they may or may not have valued school, but if they came to school, if they came to your class, it was because of you. Yes. And that's not necessarily the way it is anymore. Monte is certainly not like that. It's all about the grades, the numbers, and however you get there. Which college you're trying to... A lot of cheating, yeah, a lot of cheating going you're padding, on. You're padding your resume with right. doing things. So what I remember, what really is something to hold on to, 
is first the fact that I got to connect with so many different kinds of kids very early on. All kinds of learners, all kinds of ethnic backgrounds. I mean, I still remember uh, Joyce Kuman would bring me her grandmother's like 18 layer Dutch cake. And we're still in touch, by the way, she's back. She's still back in the, she went back to the Netherlands, but we still talk about that That's cake. That's awesome. You know, um, uh, Joe, I wanna say Oriana, but I taught in my speech class showed me how to make chili relleno, which I still make to this day. And I asked Marisela Gonzalez, a, a friend of mine, is this the way that is you do that? that? Yeah. And she said, yes, <laughs> that's, that's the way to do that. <laughs> and so I learned that, you know, from, from that kid. Bruce Trujillo, big bruiser, right? Yeah. He's in my, what, oral interpretation of literature. A lot of these kids came into this class. And I do the Peerstorf thing. I make him memorize the prologue to the Canterbury Tales in Middle English. I had him. He did it. Right? Mm, yeah. Bruce Trujillo comes up to me in a bar. <laughs> he works at this bar. <clears throat> We're talking, I don't know, six, eight, I don't know, years later. And he stands there and he goes, well, I don't know when the shore is so tough, the Druta of March, of, you know, and I just Canterbury was, Tales. I was just dying that he, yes. here's this kid, why did he have, you just you made know? a statement that I knew you had pure story, Sharon, because you just said, and the reason is, and you didn't say it's because. Say that. Because. No, 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 because. Oh, yeah. It was the reason is because, and Pierce would say, right. never say the reason is because. You can say the reason is, and then state the reason. I've never gotten over that. I listened to talk radio when I was doing my job, and people would call back, hey, uh, Jim Dunbar, uh, you know, the reason is because, and I go, oh no, Pierce Stewart. I know. And then it became, every time anybody said, the reason is, I was waiting for the other shoe to fall, That's and I right. go, I'm missing the content. You become a grammar nerd. A, a, a lot of our teachers made us grammar, grammar nerds. A grammar nerd. Uh, Many of our teachers did that. We were still diagramming sentences. We still know not to use certain prepositions. We still, I, I'm very irritated by the people who say all of the sudden. All of the sudden. What? And I think it's regional, I don't know. Never um, dangled your participle. I no. Mean, you can't do that. You it's do just... not leave them dangling. <laughs> 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 you know, we're going to close here. we got about three yeah. more minutes here. Yeah. And Sharon is going to close up on her experiences at Sunnyvale High. And then I'm going to ask her some of her favorite things. So go ahead. Okay. So, uh, again, the kinds of students, and I will tell you that I have never had and never seen a more positive teaching environment than happened there. During that time. I thought I would get busted by Ralph Kling. I used an article in class by John Wasserman. John L. Wasserman. Thank right, you. the writer. The, yeah. That was a description of the concert of the Sex Pistols. It was quite graphic. A parent complained. Sure. And I thought for sure Kling was going to go. He said, she's teaching a unit on descriptive writing. This is completely appropriate because it is descriptive. The fact that it bothers you means that it is effective description. Ralph Kling. Ralph Kling. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know. He's got my back. He's sort of, yeah. And I've always thought of him as sort of a jarhead, you know, the, I mean, in the yeah. marine sense, yeah. right? Like that. Uh, and his daughter, you know, was my yeah. class, Joanne. What round did Joanne, I wonder? Anyway, uh, so. There was a relationship between administration. I even called, we were supposed to go on strike. I even called the superintendent and I said, I'm getting migraines. I have two kids. I can't go on strike. Please make this work out. Yes. <laughs> I called him at home. It didn't occur to me that I couldn't. Yeah, the, the rules. Right? So that, I've often described it as Fort Apache, the Bronx. And the reason is not that it was bad kids out there, but simply that the unity of that staff 
you could sit, go to the faculty room, sit anywhere you wanted. It wasn't like PE was over here, and, like you see now. Um, so the staff experience, the kid experience, the connectedness of it, part of it certainly was the era. Yes. But part of it was just the people who were there. And there's just too many to name to say. No, I agree with you that. Know. So it closed in the 80-81 the year. It was the last year. Were right. you there then? I was the one who set up the closing ceremony.